listening to order and it is being recorded. <laughs> Bad enough? <laughs> uh, me. Great. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, so looking at our agenda for today, we will be starting with a review of the minutes from our 7120 meeting. And you need to assign somebody to do the minutes. Ah, uh, yes. So that was Sarah, correct? Sarah last time. All right. So who's next on the? All right. The R... Now we've got all the R's here. <laughs> um. <laughs> There's a lot of us. Yeah. I think Ashwin, you're next alphabetically. Would you be able to take minutes today? Mm, um, I would be happy to, but I may have to be ducking out and in a couple times during the next couple hours. Um, but I think I can, I can give it a shot. What, okay. um, or we can, can, I, can I, you, we can have Steve or Andra. One thing I could do is if I could start a Google Doc and share it, I can take notes um, as I can. And if I do have to duck out, someone else can tag team it with me. Is that workable? Yeah, it looks like Andra's saying yes, so maybe you and Andra could do that together. Does that sound good? Okay, Andra, I'll email you the Google Doc right now. Do I get credit? <laughs> Half credit. <laughs> You're gonna have to do it next time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really tired. I might not be so good. <laughs> well, then two is better than one, I think. Yeah. And we'll move to, to Steve next time. Um, all right, great. Thank you both. So we will look at the minutes. Um, Stephanie, do you want to pull those up or do folks have them open? They just look at them. Uh, you can do both. Okay. So are you seeing the minutes or I can never tell what you can see and I can see. Yes, we're seeing the minutes. Okay. Thanks. Near the top, it under public comment, a bit about Andrew Glace. I don't know if a word was left out. It, it's a, he expressed semicolon. He is pleased to be sitting on, on the meeting and is here to listen. And you missed the word that. Just get rid of the he expressed semicolon and start that sentence with he is pleased. That's pretty trivial, but it looks like something is missing otherwise. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Uh oh. <laughs> Right, I'll just make a note of it.
Anybody have any other comments or are we ready to have someone? Motion. I move to accept the minutes. I second. Okay, you need a roll call vote. So um, I'm just going to do it in an order of my screen. Drucker? Yes. Dumont? I'm going to abstain because I didn't really get to read them very fast. Um, okay. Breaker? Yes. Roof? Yes. Rose? Durr? Yes. Ravi Kumar? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay, and it's approved. Great. So I don't see any public here. Stephanie, is that? No public. Accurate, okay. Um, so then let's move on to staff updates. So I was just saying that the um, the MVP action grant reimbursement request was um, is being submitted. I've um, been working on it all day <laughs> and uh, that will get submitted. Um, and then that'll allow us to sort of move on freely into our next phase, which um, it's kind of exciting to kind of at least wrap a first phase up and sort of looking at what we've done and summarizing everything. Um, it's been, it's been, um, a great process so far. I mean, I just, um, I'll share it, you know, when, when I um, am completed with it, but it's been a really um, great process. And I think, you know, we've done quite a bit already, even though it seems like we're just getting to the, the really exciting part of working with the task groups. Um, there's been a lot of work done. So um, I think you should all feel really, I mean, in, in my perspective, I hope you all feel good about what you've done so far and excited about this next phase. Can I ask a question about that, Stephanie? Yep. Well, I don't totally understand what the upcoming grant is for. It's not, it's just that there are two phases. It's um, the, the grant was broken up into two phases. So it was portioned out. We got $100,000, but some of it was for a phase one, which is, it was tied to the fiscal year. So we had to complete certain tasks by June 30th, which we did. Um, thank you, Linnean, for really being on top of that. And, um, and then the next phase, phase two, is just the, the larger share of the funding will enable us to sort of move forward uh, with, the, with the task group work and actually starting to compile drafting a plan. So it's not a new grant, it's just the same grant broken out in phases, that's all. We just really squeaked, you know, <laughs> by, and, you know, June 30th was our cutoff and we managed to actually submit invoices and complete tasks on the 30th, which was um, pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Great, anything else, Stephanie? Um, I'm, yeah, I mean, there's probably much more I could say, but right now, I'm sorry, I am just a little <laughs> overdone with um, grant reporting, so I don't have anything at the top of my head. No problem. <clears throat> um, ECAC members, <laughs> any, any updates beyond what's on the agenda for today? Yeah, Darcy. Well, we had talked about reporting to the town council, so I guess that is in process of um, figuring out whether we can report as part of the regular town council agenda. That's hasn't really been brought up with the council president yet. Um, and whether we should get a like a 10 minute presentation sometime in the near future. Yeah, thanks for that. So I, um, after you emailed about that, I reached out to Stephanie. And so Stephanie is going to get on the agenda for a 10 minute update on 
the MVP work kind of as it relates to our and ECAC as well, but from from I think the perspective of the MVP. And then I don't know, Darcy, is that something that you would do to get on the regular agenda for an ECAC update or do I need to email Lynn about that? I can do it. Okay. Uh, I can attempt. That's never been one of the regular reports that committees report on, um, but I can ask to get it on there. Yes. Okay. Why don't you do that? And if, if that doesn't work for some reason, if they, if she says no, then we can sort of reassess. Okay, sure. <coughs> Excuse me. And just to be clear, um, I'll probably check in with um, the town manager just to make sure I, I just need to run it by him and make sure that, you know, it's something he wants me to do as well. Anyone else? No, we're good. Okay, great. So I will turn it over to Linnean to introduce niche engineering. Fantastic. Um, hey everybody, nice to see everybody again. Um, uh, so um, as part of sort of the initial conception of the climate action adaptation planning, pardon the fact that I live in a very busy corner and it gets noisy, uh, or I work in a busy corner. Um, uh, the, uh, we invited uh, niche engineering and specifically Isabel Kalbish into uh, our team uh, to bring expertise around uh, um, infrastructure planning, uh, stormwater systems, uh, other other types of infrastructure of which they do a lot of work around municipalities uh, and I believe some in in uh, Amherst as well uh, and uh, to be part of uh, the sort of resource team for uh, developing the plan so we want to just take this opportunity for Isabel to introduce herself to introduce niche and to talk a little bit about sort of what they're learning and uh, and uh, some ideas about where we might go. And Isabel, I'm sure you have a particular perspective on what you're gonna say, uh, which is great. Um, so I will turn it over, well, wait, before I do that, I'd just like to note, uh, um, I have worked with Isabel uh, and Niche in a number of different ways over the years uh, in a lot of different things that, uh, that we have done and in different projects. Uh, probably the last time Isabel and I worked together was a project that she was running for the town of Nahant to run their MVP process, uh, which was quite interesting. Um, so anyway, we have a relatively long uh, um, history together working in different ways. Uh, and that was why I thought they would be a good addition to this process. Isabel. Thank you, Jim, um, and thank you all for inviting me to, to join you today on your call. My name is Isabel Kalbisch with Niche Engineering. Until a year ago, I ran my own consulting firm, Clarendon Hill, and um, so I wear, I'm a planner. I'm an urban and environmental planner, and at Niche Engineering, I feel that is a good role, like to, to bring the, uh, the more holistic and a larger picture to a sometimes smaller engineering perspective. And so far, the, um, the interaction with the engineering team has, has gone very well. And um, yeah, so a little bit of background about niche engineering. Um, so we are a, an engineering firm that focuses on surveying, uh, transportation, planning, civil engineering, and structural work in addition to the planning that we are providing. And um, so as such, we, we kind of like know municipal projects from various angles and perspectives. And um, uh, so we, we look at infrastructure both very holistically. So from the planner side, we bring that more uh, holistic envisioning aspect to things. Um, so when we look at projects, so I would say what we're doing right now as to identifying opportunities and strategies um, for your town is more like the holistic uh, planning perspective. 
and then working with all my colleagues um, who are like very they can go they can drill down so to say like into into the soil and into the pipes and they really understand how to fit things in and how they work and um, on on that on the water or uh, pipe infrastructure um, aspect and um, so we find that this um this approach coming coming from like a broader perspective and then thinking through projects how they would apply to specific locations and it's not just stormwater infrastructure um what you mentioned but it's also it pertains to transportation planning it pertains to overall um, aspects um so we find that we can by bringing those expertise we can identify solutions that work very well for particular aspects and so typically we are brought on so we have a lot of municipal working relationships i don't have the, the numbers on at the top of my head but i think we have like 82 or we, we work with a lot of towns, so probably half of Massachusetts, and we work very well with the um, in the engineering departments and also the planning departments. And um, we are brought on to like install solutions. Um, and so one project that Jim mentioned was in the town of Northampton, um, just nearby, um, where we had like a similar role um, to what I would envision might come out here. So <laughs> not, not taking, yeah, just leave it at that. So in, in Northampton, we um, work together with another uh, engineering planning slash firm and uh, we were brought on to assist with the visioning um, aspect and then identify solutions like around town like where those could be implemented and so we we had like an approach of so how would we address um stormwater issues uh, flooding issues around town and what could be done about those and um and so then we were tasked with developing the strategies and the solutions for that and so as, as you know or um as, as jim and lauren may have mentioned so the the task we are targeted with um, for your town for Amherst is um, like looking at the both the stormwater infrastructure at the water system overall at the wastewater system the drain system the transportation sector and also at procurement so it's it's kind of like a good mix and we feel like there might be some value added and I don't know like where these discussions are going but they I I heard that there, there are like particular target areas that where it would be beneficial to have us like bring our lens on the resilient understanding and how, how things work on. So we're we're flexible. We're looking forward to uh, working with you and hearing your ideas. Um, like for for the most part as well because we. We have a good understanding. We read the MVP reports. We read like all the good strategies that your committee already identified. So uh, kudos to that. So to all the 35 or 40 different strategies that were listed on transportation um, planning and um, stormwater infrastructure and, and all of that. So I think uh, from and the perspective um, where I'm coming from as an MVP provider, working with a lot of towns, um, I think it will be beneficial to get into brainstorming and identifying like what are the kind of like top five or what strategies that you all agree on and where you think this is really worthwhile putting forward and how can that be done. And then again, like niche with our um, more gr ground proofed strategy and approach we can help you like identify where we could where we could work those strategies so to say and um yeah so how we will participate in a, in a project uh, moving forward is uh, from what we had discussed with, with jim and lauren so far is we will be uh, participating in in one of your uh, in one of the next um, committee um, meetings and we would envision this to be like um, 
more like a listening or an active listening session for us. So where we would prepare some questions and ask you about like your concerns and your ideas and your strategies where you think this might work. And um, then uh, in, a, in a second meeting, we, we would be hoping to like come up with some strategies based on what we hear um, that we would want to suggest to you moving forward. So I know this, this was a lot and uh, we, we're just getting to, to know each all, but so this, this has been like my um, takeaway from the interactions I had so far <laughs> on the project. And uh, Stephanie and I, we also had a, a meeting with um, Guildford last week. So we are, we're in the process of meeting with the important uh, stakeholders and um, so we're definitely looking forward to, to working with you all and um, looking forward to receiving all the, uh, the comments or questions or whatever you have for us so we can uh, provide you with our services as best as possible. Um, Isabel, what, can you talk briefly about the, uh, the green infrastructure project in uh, Northampton? Not, you don't have to talk in depth about it, but just sort of what was the goal of the project Kind of what role did did niche end up playing uh i mean just as a little side note uh, linnean mm -hmm. was also involved in that project uh, around community engagement for it which was a very small part of the project um yeah so um i wasn't running that project so that was before my time <laughs> um but um, my colleague jen who was also on this call so stephanie you met jen <coughs> And I'll call with Guilford last week. Um, so niche, niche role on that project was to uh, work with the, with the committee essentially to look at um, highly flooded areas around town. And there were like 10 sites that had been identified by the town um, as being like critical um, from from various um, perspectives, but but mostly because they were like highly frequented, or um, there was like a lot of rainwater that came down, so they they had like a, um, yeah, they were an area of concern, and so for these ten sites, um, it was then decided that Niche would kind of like run an analysis and look at. Uh, the percentage of uh, curvy surface and uh, like what those sites could take on or are taking on like currently and what the opportunities for improvement were. So what could be done in order to make those sites flood less. And um, yeah, so this is one thing we do like on a daily basis, like we do a lot of modeling and we run calculations for areas and we know like what a particular area can take on as to as to stormwater and what it can store and what then what not can be stored results in runoff. And so that's um, obviously a combination of particular factors, uh, including the soil type and including the amount of impervious surface and um, yeah, the amount of rain, like if it's a it's just a light rain or if it's like a real storm event that uh, floods out uh, like within a couple of minutes um, areas. And as, as we know, with climate change, we're, in, we're, we're seeing increasing rainstorm events, higher frequency and also higher intensity rain events. And uh, so we have like models that um, are geared towards like analyzing all these factors. So it's it, essentially we can play around with uh, the amount of rainfall that is received for a particular area. And then we can increase that rainfall just to, to model any kind of likelihood in, in the future. And that's, that's one example of like how, how we assess uh, the risk of a particular area and, and how uh, yeah, and how that could be improved. And then for the improvement, um, again, we, we play with a couple of factors such as, okay, what could happen if we would install a particular uh, green infrastructure measure, for example, and it could be 
green infrastructure measures are like a white turn term um, so it could be a bias whale and I, from Stephanie I know that you're already doing uh, or you already have green infrastructure installed around town but maybe there are like particular other areas where um, like improvements would happen down the road and uh, so there would be an added benefit of adding like green infrastructure and so just to give you some more examples so bias whales are like a, a, a typical a green infrastructure measure where uh, like at a street corner um, you would um, open up the area and you could in install like storm drains and those can be installed practically anywhere and it and if the soil is not the right condition we can make it right so it, uh, meaning it's green infrastructure is not always just green but it can also be a hybrid and so for, for example if it's like a very uh, dense area you, you you would add like additional means just to to get your water detention water storage and i don't want to go into too much detail here not to get too technical but just delivering the the message that um there is no site where you can't achieve more stormwater storage per se so you you can make it happen and if it's a combination of green and hybrid and gray infrastructure in place that's great if the desire is to just upgrade the, the gray infrastructure, um, that also can be done. Um, yeah, and so where I was going with this? So the uh, in Northampton, essentially that was the approach. So we looked at the sites, at the 10 sites, and we, uh, based on like the conditions at the sites and interactions with stakeholders such as yourself, and uh, like just listening to what would have the best co-benefits um, and would work well like for the budget and for all kind of particular reasons. Um, we narrowed it down to three priority sites that were particularly well regarded because of their location. And, um, and then we uh, did conceptual designs and designs that then led into the construction of, um, of those measures in, in Northampton. And since then, um, the air stormwater flooding conditions have, have been uh, improving overall and added to, so one side, for example, was like an environmental justice area, so where an additional co-benefit was gained by just adding more green space. And I mean, so the opportunities are wide because you can also add like park benches and uh, oftentimes, uh, like another great example we worked on is um, is the uh, is the water uh, program in DC. It's called Street Kennedy Project or Water DC Project. And that's like we work with a, a landscape architect firm and that project addressed 33 best management practices. And those are best management practices are essentially like different types of green infrastructure. And it was it was just a regular street, um, highly pervious, um, but we were able to to fit in like a a lot of techniques, a lot of additional like complete streets combined with green streets. And uh, then we fit in educational measures, we fit in art um, techniques. So it's, it's, it's phenomenal. So I can, if, if that's of interest, I can send you some information material. Um, but so there are, there's a wide variety of how far you want to take it and what's the purpose and no town is similar to the other one. We're very well aware of that. So this is why uh, our approach is typically, we, we just want to, to listen more to what you want to achieve and what are your interests. And then we can try to make it happen and, um, and design or come up with a strategy that, that meets, meets your interests. Great, thanks, thanks, Isabel. Um, any questions? Yeah, Steve. Yeah, I um, thank you, Isabel. Um, I'm Steve Roof. I'm a professor of Earth and Environmental Science at Hampshire College, and I've been involved for quite a few years, kind of 
managing some of the 800 acres that we have there and working with colleagues consider soil sequester soil carbon sequestration and i'm wondering if that's part of the, your package of experiences if you might be able to then help us come up with strategies for managing our lands both forests farm fields and other open spaces to maximize carbon sequestration as part of our carbon mitigation plans mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And this is a super exciting topic. <laughs> and we just had another uh, team call about that. Um, and uh, yeah, we like looking at the, the land use in, Amher in Amherst and like at all, all the area that is there. I think there's a huge potential for like tapping into those solutions because um, it's already there. So you, you have like plenty of forest area, you have very well fitted um, soils. So we would definitely love to investigate that um, topic area more. And one thing I did not bring up yet um, is like the, the big linkage between green infrastructure, um, where people typically look at, at being just an adaptation measure to um, climate change because you you have like green infrastructure gives you the opportunity to store and detain and filter more water to add to increased water quality which obviously is like in everybody's interest in Amherst given that you have a lot of wells and people use it as drinking water um, but that's not the end of the game because due to the fact that uh, green infrastructure um, can be used for like filtering the water and for absorbing more water. It also means that less water would go down uh, the, the stormwater pipes. And it, it, it re there are studies out there and we're just getting our head really wrapped around like what that all contains. But there are definitely some good indicators like how green infrastructure can add to cost savings overall uh, because you would need less pumping. Um, yeah, you would have less water flowing through pipes overall. And not to go into too much detail here, and obviously there's also maintenance standards with engineering perspective because there also needs to be an equivalent of water flowing through those drains, otherwise you get detrimental benefits down the road from that. So we are cognizant of that. But point being, green infrastructure addresses not just adaptation questions, but also mitigation um, questions for climate change because, um, yeah, the, the carbon footprint is reduced overall through that. So I'd love to investigate that some more with you, Steve. Great. Great. <laughs> Great. Thank you uh, for joining and looking forward to working together. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me join and uh, have a great rest of your afternoon and evening. Fantastic, Isabel. Thanks a ton. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Isabel. Take care. Hi, Isabel. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Okay, great. Um, so now we're going to turn it over to Steve to talk a little bit about the building electrification work um, that he's been involved with. And I think the um, intent of this discussion is just to learn a little bit more about it and then maybe discuss what we think the best role for ECAC should be. And Steve, if you have any proposals on that. Okay, thank you. I, I'll, I'll kind of give an update of where we are, what we've done which is just getting started and answer any questions and then we can have that bigger conversation of how, how and what ECAC itself could be doing to help with this. Um, so we have had one big group meeting a couple of weeks ago and then on Friday, last past Friday, a team meeting with the Amherst team with one of the uh, coaches from the RMI, um, the woman who had worked with Brooklyn, I think. And the Amherst, I'm just switching here to my notes on that. The Amherst meeting was nice. I was a little bit late joining. I was actually out on Cape Cod and didn't remember the meeting until somebody emailed me. <laughs> Stephanie sat in, Andra was there. 
um, Chris Riddle, who has sometimes been in our meetings, and then Felicia, and I forget Felicia's last name now. Um, she's with Mothers Out Front, and Andra knows her. Um, so this group of us plus, um, gosh, I'm popping the name. Who's our, our, our coach there with RMI? Um, uh, Coral, Coral, anyways. So um, our meeting on Friday was a chance to kind of get the team organized, to get introduced, to discuss a few things, and to plan next coming steps. So uh, with Stephanie there, we were able to talk a little bit about the history of, uh, of existing pro progress in Amherst, the town uh, council's goal of 50% carbon reduction, the zero energy bylaw mandating zero energy town buildings, and um, the CCA progress and that's moving along a little bit about the solarized mass program um, and a few other things that Amherst is a green community and a member of the New England Municipal Sustainability Network and then oh the other thing that we talked a little bit about is that Amherst is affected by the the um, Berkshire gas moratorium so already there's a sort of de facto ban on new gas connections with Berkshire, Berkshire Gas. Um, it doesn't seem that that moratorium is going to lift anytime soon or ever um, and how that might have a factor play a role or um, help with the electrification process. So we're looking forward to working more together and, and um, some strategies to connect what we're already doing and have done with this electrification bylaw which the RMI, the Rocky Mountain Institute, is sort of um, heading um, or helping us achieve. Their hope is that our team would have a, an electrification bylaw ready to present to the um, authoritative voting mechanism, which in our case would be town council, by the end of 2021. Doesn't have to be passed then, but they're hoping that each of their teams in different communities will have something prepared to be um, presented to the community by that time span. So that's fairly soon. There's the experience from Brookline and Arlington, quite a bit of groundwork to do, quite a little bit of research, and then quite a bit of networking outreach and lobbying to get this sort of thing passed. Um, in the packet was some background that had been presented uh, by, by uh, prepared and presented by Arlington and Brookline, which I hope you've had a chance to read. Um, there's two, they each provided some uh, one or two page info sheets that they gave to the public. They gave to, in some cases, town meeting members or town councilors and other decision makers. Um, and then there was some, there's some other documents there. The, the one that's a little bit longer is the Brookline fossil fuel overview slides with some 30 slides. It goes into a little bit more detail and answers at least some of the questions that came up in terms of what the Brookline's bylaw um, encompassed and what it did not. Maybe I'll catch my breath there and see if anybody has any questions at this step. And I, might, I thought I might just briefly summarize the Brooklyn fossil fuel prohibition bylaw as a next step. But does anybody have anything to either add who's participating or uh, questions? Go ahead, Darcy, unmute yourself. I got some noisy people in the next yard, so <laughs> trying to protect you. Um, so I think I asked this at the last meeting, but is the ordinance mostly focused on banning new gas connections or um, and was there discussion of, uh, you know, the likelihood of Joe Comerford's legislation passing that, you know, provides for a statewide um, net, you know, zero net energy stretch code? I don't know anything about the Joe, Joe Comerford's um, proposal, and I'm not sure if I've missed that. Um, Stephanie or Andra could chime in if they have heard if that was part of the discussion. The Brooklyn and I believe Arlington focused on new fossil fuel piping, either gas or oil, prohibiting in new buildings or in significant rehabs, gut rehabilitations, um, preventing the installation of fossil fuel piping, either natural gas or oil heat. So yeah, so that sounds good. That that seems like that would be um, 
e an easy lift because of the fact that we already have it. <laughs> De facto, um, seems good. Okay. I mean, just I mean, just to be uh, mentioned. Sorry, but I mean, oil does is not delivered by pipeline. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, how does the moratorium on pipelines affect oil heat? It's not on pipelines. It, uh, the wording here is fossil fuel piping in the buildings. And so it's all behind the meter, behind the street, only in the building. And it's, I believe it prohibits the installation of the piping for natural gas or for fuel oil. Mm -hmm. So in one of the sections it mentions it, 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 the bylaws designed not to conflict with any zoning, regulatory code or state law. So it cannot have an impact on natural gas infrastructure in the street or regulating other things that the state already regulates. So attempting to do that by strictly um, regulating the, the stuff in the house. I don't think it does cover oil actually. I think we're gonna have to bring that to this project. I mean, there is a local permit for hooking up oil in a house. Um, and maybe it's getting at that to prohibit that activity. Brookline and Arlington have not done that. They just did gas. Okay. But we could extend it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at their overview slide and it does say gas or oil. It prohibits the installation of new fossil fuel piping, gas or oil in buildings. Okay. And maybe that got, <coughs> got knocked out at some point in the way, along the way. Um, do you want to add anything else, either Stephanie or Andra, who've been participating in some of these meetings? The, then I'll kind of go on a little bit. The key aspect of the Brooklyn and Arlington um, bylaw is that there are waivers that allow for fossil fuel infrastructure to be granted on, on a couple of broad cases and also a case by case basis where a a, a new sustainability review board is appointed by the Brookline, in this case, the Brookline Select Board to oversee a waiver process. So businesses or homeowners could apply for a waiver. But the law does not, um, find, does not affect, um, where does it go? Do, 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 does not affect gas pipelines, gas meters. Um, do, 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 ah. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Um, <laughs> it's, it doesn't, rehabilitation has to be more than 75% of the floor area for residential and more than 50% of commercial buildings. So on the rehab side, it's a fairly large, um, has to be a fairly substantial rehab, rehab in order to kick in this law. Um, it doesn't apply, where am I? Stand by. I'm trying to find the, the couple of places where it says that. Um, all right, here it is. Okay, so it provides exemptions for emergency power systems for, for um, buildings or housing complexes. It provides exemptions. It allows fossil fuel fuel for central domestic hot water systems in buildings over than 10,000 square feet. And also for commercial kitchens, it allows um, for fossil fuel, gas, or whatnot. As some specialized equipment is too costly to operate, such as pizza ovens. Um, and residential cooking was something that Brookline added as an exemption during the negotiation process, as well as an exemption for laboratories and medical facilities. But they mentioned those are some things that came out in discussions that they added to the bylaw in, um, over the progress. So there are those exemptions, and as I mentioned, there are certain waivers. So if people want to argue in front of a, in this case, so-called uh, sustainability review board, they could they could try to get um, a gas or, or uh, get a waiver for the restrictions. There is one thing that Brookline provides yeah. a little bit more information on the cost and benefits. Um, they provide some explanation that all electric, all electric technology is available and exists today and is cost competitive, whether that's air sourced heat pumps for heating or induction stovetops and electric heat pump hot water heaters. So they describe those. They provide a fairly simple example for a new house 
what the cost differential would be from installing gas heat and water and central air conditioning in the, in the traditional way versus using air, air source heat pumps. And there's a slight increase, actually decrease in the cost in the first few years, over 10 years, they show up basically becoming a wash in terms of overall costs with the air source heat pump equipment being slightly less expensive to install, but with a slightly higher annual operating cost based on, um, I guess, current electric rates. So that would be the kind of analysis that we might want to update and uh, make more specific to Amherst if we were going to try to um, take this to the town and try to get support for it. I think that gives us an idea of what we could do. The, the main thing is that this is only, this project, the whole project is only addressing new buildings. And lots of people are interested, including Chris Riddle, um, and, and gut rehab. Um, and, um, a, but, you know, there's people interested and um, we've been told that there will probably be a lot of side conversations of interest to um, the existing building stock. Uh, but that's not what this project is. Right, yeah, this, this, this was new buildings and major rehabs. Um, I guess the last thing I'll add about the Brookline and Arlington examples are they've both been passed by their town governments. Both are being reviewed by the Mass Attorney General to see if they are consistent with state law. That, that has not been determined yet. That should happen by the end of this month. And so that'll be a major milestone for all these other communities to see if the law is acceptable to the state attorney general. And if not, what aspects of it are not acceptable and would need to be modified um, in order for it or similar laws in other communities to be considered acceptable by the state. So I sort of feel like, you know, let's wait another week or two and see what the attorney general says, whether this law has a chance of being um, successful are considered legal by the Attorney General. So that'll be upcoming. Hopefully we'll hear about that fairly soon. Um, as Andra mentioned, one of the threads of conversation we had last Friday was that this, this, this bylaw is sort of the stick approach to forcing people to move away from fossil fuels. We also have quite a few carrot approaches, um, whether they're incentive programs through Mass Save or Mass CEC, um, and the Solarize Amherst program that Stephanie has sort of shepherded through provides opportunities for things like heat pumps. So I think in parallel, I think it would be very nice to look at in positive incentives for homeowners to and businesses to make these changes um, without being required to. So that'll be it. Um, working with some of those other entities that can provide those incentives and seeing a way, I think, a way to get the word out that those things are available, they're cost effective, you know, it's a good move, and maybe provide, we could provide some coaching or advice or at least uh, um, help them find the resources to, to pursue those further. I have a, I don't know, kind of structural question, um, Steve, if this is something that you know, you're going to be putting time into. Um, it seems like you ought to be on the building task group. Um, I don't know if there's any flexibility there, but um, I don't know how you see that <laughs> in terms of your, your time. Um, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I guess I'll leave that to uh, Chief Laura to uh, authorize any change in the membership of, the, of those committees. Um. Yeah, we, that, we, that certainly could be talked about. And I mean, I think Chris Riddle is on the task group, the building task group as well, right? He is, and I am, I'm attending all of the task group meetings as well. So but I can, do you plan on attending all of the building electrification? I'm going to as many as I can, but I can also coordinate with Steve. So not that I have to, I mean, I can certainly, I think if this is something that's going to be moving forward in the town, I definitely want to sort of be involved and stay on top of that information. So I um, do not 
intend to keep being really involved. I kind of want to get it off to a good start, but we do need some more community members to be mm -hmm. a part of it. I think a bigger team would be very beneficial. So think about it. Who, so who I think, might, yeah, sorry. Just think of who might be re recruited for it. Yeah, and I think, um, and Sarah, you're on with Jesse on the buildings, correct? Um, I think that this could be a topic of discussion for their task group meeting to see if within that group we could recruit more people. I guess my overarching question is, do we feel that the participation in this process is going to provide significant help to us to get to this end goal or or not i think my my opinion at this point is i uh, yes i think and hope so mm -hmm. um, I, the rmi team is pretty strong and then the coaches that they've assembled from arlington and brookline and some other places i think will provide a wealth of experience and I guess I'm hoping that we still, we can wait a little while to decide whether we're going to pursue a fossil fuel prohibition bylaw, or we might shift more towards um, promoting the incentives, the carrot approach to encouraging shifts away from fossil fuels, um, or I don't know if there's an in between to that. So I'm trying to keep an open mind right now and, and not fully committing in my head that we're going to create a bylaw by the end of the year and, and try to get that passed in town. That's a possibility yet. I'm not convinced that that's the biggest bang for our buck in terms of time commitment. Um, there's a few things I want to try to analyze and that would be along the lines of what would be the impact to our total greenhouse gas budget of an enacting such a bylaw. And for Brookline, they estimated it that the bylaw by itself could lead to a 10% reduction. If there was something like a half percent of their buildings were renovated every year for 15 years, um, that would provide up to about a 10% reduction. I'd, I'd like to try to do an analysis like that for Amherst considering our housing mix. And I hope to get some help from the, the coaches and the RMI team on how we might go about doing that analysis. Um, the other factor we want to consider is, is there an impact on housing costs um, with such a bylaw and be able to address that uh, as we if, we, if and when we bring it out to the community. And that would be cost to renters, it would be cost for housing costs, it would be um, building costs for businesses. Uh, is this going to cost people more? Um, I think that's going to be a question that people are going to have. And then, yeah, the other question is people say, I, well, I like to cook on gas. I don't want to shift to electricity. So there, there's a preference that um, is the other aspect. Yeah. But I think it's worth pursuing. I'm interested in continuing to pursue this and then sort of see in the coming weeks what the best avenue might be and what we might choose, figure out with the rest of the teammates from the Amherst side, how we might best pursue this sort of thing in Amherst. I just um, add, on, add on that to, to what uh, Steve mentioned. I think the the um, and I I think this is great to be part of this um, effort. Uh, obviously, we're not making any commitments, but we're learning a lot along the way, um, and and, and uh, with some real experts uh, nationally as well as in our um, uh, colleague towns in Massachusetts. Um, I guess I would want to focus a, a bit on the cost. Um, just looking at the uh, slides that um, Brookline put forward, following through some of their examples. Just from my mind, it, 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 there's um, their assumptions on costs of heat pumps seems to be um, generous. Um, <laughs> um, uh, now, <clears throat> in our favor, um, costs hopefully go down over time. Uh, but at the same time, especially when you're talking about a bylaw, I think you also have to look at what does the world look like if there's not incentives. Uh, right. because um, uh, these incentives are um, a result of, of uh, state policies as well. And, and tech, uh, as these markets tend to grow, especially a rebate program, they can't afford to keep giving uh, as much uh, incentives. Uh, so the incentive levels can, uh, can go down or be eliminated. In fact, I, I don't believe MassEC gives rebates to heat pumps unless they're whole house heat pumps, which um, would be the case. 
uh, in the, in this bylaw, I would think. But um, then I look at it and it looks like it's uh, pretty generous on the initial cost. <laughs> um, so especially, you know, because of our um, deep concern and regard for impacts, particularly on uh, moderate and low income, um, uh, and what, what that might mean with regard to affordable housing and what mechanisms there might be uh, also to help if we do put a bylaw like this forward, what mechanisms might there be to um, either further subsidize or somehow make sure it's not a barrier um, to affordable housing? Yeah, just to, to amplify a bit there what Dwayne was saying, their, their assumption for a single family home, the heat pump would be about 12,500, but rebates would bring that down more than 50% to just under 6,000. So the economics of their calculation depend a lot on several different credits. So that's a very good point, Dwayne. We'd want to investigate that. I thought that pricing seemed a little generous too. Yeah, even the 12,000 for a whole yeah. 2,500 square feet. 2,500, yeah. I mean, it was a couple of years ago, but I put in three heat pumps and it was, and they were just room, room, room units and is far in excess of that. Right. But remember, we're talking about new construction. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is very right. different. Yeah. Uh, okay, so it sounds like, um, you know, in the interest of time, we can we can move on from now. But let's keep this, um, you know, at front of mind to talk about if if there's updates to to be had. Um, from my perspective, it seems like. Let's continue to follow it. Let's, um, particularly with the building working group, um, maybe offer up a chance for Chris Riddle to to speak to it a little bit in in the meeting when you have it. You know, obviously leaving it up to you all as the building group to decide, um, and maybe draw up some additional com community support. Um, but I think we were raising a lot of interesting questions around, you know, how. I think this will be one piece of the puzzle of buildings in general and how much of the piece of the puzzle it would be and how it's framed, whether we can expand it beyond new buildings or whether we wanna, you know, I think all of that is to be determined. Um, so I think just stay tuned. I think also the question about affordable housing and then how do we, I mean, when we look to our sort of overarching goal of uh, just transition away from fossil fuel use like is there what can we do to help support that among low income uh, and renters in our community this probably isn't the way to do that but like in the big picture of housing and buildings how are we how are we doing that and this may be one piece of the puzzle right yeah Darcy oh you're you're muted I think I, um, one of the things that we haven't done as a town yet is, um, is, uh, you know, get involved in the, the heat pump, the, the program that's like Solarize Amherst, only it's like heat pump Amherst. And um, that would like, seem like it'd be a great complement to being involved in this, the, the ordinance, the, program to put forward an ordinance because then we would be we would have an alternative you know that we could offer at a discount at the same time to as a sales <laughs> you know it would help sell the the, uh, the initiative but uh, so I don't know what the story is with that Stephanie is that rolling is that something that is a grant program that you know, is available on an ongoing basis, or how does that work? We can't hear you. <laughs> You're muted. Sorry about that. You're yeah. muted. I was muted to tell you you were muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So um, it, it's I haven't looked at it recently. Um, it has been kind of an ongoing opportunity. I don't think that it's anything that's going to go away because I think there's really going to be even more of a push. Um, for um, promoting heat pumps and heat pump technology. So I, you know, I think the timing is actually good for us. 
especially if we're looking at sort of partnering this with something else, um, you know, over next year. Um, I do think it's good to sort of have a package, uh, as you suggested. I think that's a great idea. Um, so, you know, it, it's something in my mind that we would eventually, there was no question in my mind that we'll do this program at some point. It's just been the timing, you know, we, with CCA happening, you know, it just seems like we want the timing to sort of be right, um, you know, with sort of putting these things all together and presenting them to the community. Okay, great. Um, well, I think that's a good segue to our next agenda item, which is task group work. Um, so Lauren or Jim? Yeah, uh, happy to, uh, I've been on the two that have happened so far. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> first, the, the, that last discussion was very interesting. That was great. Um, uh, and I think there's just going to be a, a ton of inter intersection here in, in these processes, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, so much work going on. It's just exciting. Um, uh, so, so far we've had two uh, uh, meetings of uh, facilitators to set up the task group meetings, uh, which has, uh, <laughs> um, Lauren, Lauren is having trouble with her connection. Um, uh, um, the, uh, uh, so I'll talk about the task group meetings first, and then I'll talk about uh, some of the other uh, work that we're doing just very quickly. Uh, the two task group meetings, we had the renewables uh, task group facilitator group meeting, uh, and we had the buildings and energy task group facilitator meeting. So each of those were myself, Stephanie, Kazikaya, and then uh, the two uh, co-facilitators, members of the uh, 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 ECAC. Um, both of those meetings, I thought, I thought both of those meetings were fantastic. Uh, really got a ton of work done, uh, set up what was gonna happen at the task group meetings. Uh, we have some work to do to get to them uh, and also picked uh, dates for them, which is also very exciting. Um, we have two more of them, one tomorrow morning and one Friday. Uh, and then we'll have all of them set, which is all very exciting. Uh, I, I don't know how, you guys felt I sort of felt like all right we're, we're finally in the into the guts of this process um, and it was, uh, it was exciting that way um, anybody want to comment on any of that yeah it'd be great to hear from the ECAC folks yeah if you completely disagree with Jim or not <laughs> terrible <laughs> I don't know what Jim's talking about <laughs> no I, I, I felt similar um, it felt like we were tangibly doing work, even though Jim would ask a question and I would have to sit with it for a while before I came to anything productive. Um, but I feel like we created the bones of a really, what I think is going to be a really, um, I think, creative and hopefully engaging uh, meeting. Yeah, I thought, uh, I'll go first, Andrew, and <laughs> you can, or unless you have, um, I thought ours went uh, really, well is it actually um, uh, a, a good meeting in that we actually um, you know really thought hard about um, where we were going um, and how to strategically um, present this information and learn and, and sort of the mix between educating and learning uh, from from the group um, I think we uh, start off with a list of all our strategies and like we're scratching our heads of like how do we how do we present this? Uh, and so it was actually, Jim sort of st stimulated the discussion about, you know, let's maybe back off a little bit and first really use the first meeting um, to talk about values and goals um, with regard to on, on the electricity side of really what does the community uh, really um, are, are looking for in terms of uh, electric um, uh, use in, in the town uh, in terms of, uh, uh, where that comes from, how locally or not, um, the cost of it, et cetera. 
at sort of a high level of sort of what the what the values are, and then we can sort of take that into the second of the three meetings uh, and talk about, and then start talking about um, uh, un, un, uh, um, un, unleashing some of the strategies um, and have conversations of these different strategies uh, with regard to those values and goals, uh, and then use the third meeting to really try to um, set up a um, consensus on uh, on where our recommendations may fall, or at least from from this group, uh, recommendations I guess to ECAC to then recommend to to the town. I, I love the uh, description of unleashing the strategies. Okay, <laughs> I was trying to come up with a better word, but that's all the case. Yeah, pretty good word. Sorry. Well, what we um, I, I think that the idea of starting with principles is really important because. Um, like all of these um, task groups, there's a lot of technical aspects to it, and not everyone is going to be interested at that level. And yet we want everyone to be able to contribute meaningfully. And so I think what I went away with is the idea that um, we're going to have um, some guidance, you know, from the group about how to make decisions, but we're not going to make all the decisions during their time with us. Um, but we'll take those principles forward in um, what deciding what we're going to recommend in terms of um, actual projects to further uh, the, the, you know, like how, how important is it to them to have local ownership? Um, how important is it to um, keep costs down? You know, there, there's going to be some significant principles that, of course, will be in conflict, um, but that, that will be the contribution in a lot of ways. And then also we, we did talk about how wanting to have ways for them to continue engaging going forward in this process. Great, that sounds exciting. Um, and yeah, I, I love that idea of having principles that then we can go back to and, and use as a sort of justification is not the right word, but to show like these, this is why we, we, we did it this way because it aligns with these principles this way. It allows, allows us to be more transparent with kind of a, a blueprint of, of, of language. Yeah, I thought it was a great idea. That uh, yeah, Stephen, it was, it was a great sorry. conversation that led us here. Somebody else? Sorry. Oh, I was just gonna. Uh, Jesse's not here, but one of the things Jesse really pointed out um, in Billings, and um, I think Sarah totally agreed, as well as Jim and I, that you know the conflict is actually really good because if you have the conflict and then you have a discussion about the conflict and you come to some uh, some kind of resolution to work it out, that's an incredible opportunity to have that kind of you know dialogue um, and interaction within the group because it's also going to be reflective of the community at large really so um, conflict is not in this case necessarily a bad thing um, so yeah. he's not here so I'm adding that for him I really like the idea that, that we'll we'll develop these ideas concepts and then um, we'll bring to the second meeting some very specific things and, and actually practice kind of working them through. What would it mean if we did it this way? And, um, so I think that cool. it is going to be engaging. You're getting me excited for Darcy and ours uh, Friday afternoon meeting, which I'm not super excited about the time, but now I'm excited about the content. <laughs> Uh, I everyone, think this is, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, this is Lauren. I'm having internet issues, um, so I can't put my video on right now, um, but just wanted to say that I um, just got back from vacation and heard about the meetings on Monday and Tuesday, and I'm so glad that they were so stimulating and just really looking forward to the two to come. Yeah. I have a couple questions because I haven't done it yet. <laughs> Um, and I'm just wondering if you, if you started from a point of the goals that have already been passed by the town council, that's number one. 
and secondly, um, whether whether the whole idea of best practices of other towns factored in somewhere. No. Anybody? Sarah, <laughs> you want to talk a little bit about best practices from other towns and sort of starting with the goals? Uh, so we, similar to I think what Dwayne was saying about how Jim encouraged us to kind of look higher across like guiding principles that then the goals would kind of fill up underneath our meeting one goal is mostly about kind of creating a shared language and vision for what we're doing for these three meetings. So we're only setting up meeting one in the meeting that we had yesterday. So then I think the things that you're talking about, Darcy, will come up after we kind of create this shared framework. At least that's what we're doing in, in ours and working on um, relationship building, getting to know one another, letting people start to generate ideas and so that was kind of the bulk of what we were trying to to hash out is how do we how do we get people to talk about lived experience expertise and all of these things in a way that falls underneath our yeah as i would call them overriding our principles same same as your group um and then next week we'll hit the next meeting we'll hit more on tactical strategies informed by the MVP process and other plans, which we've been trying to juggle into a kind of a chaotic list <laughs> right now. So, and we've got some thoughts from Chris Riddle too. So um, we need to get that into a little bit more of a manageable list. Into something, right. You um, love it, did you say? I say into something. Um, into something, yeah. Uh, um, but a really great work. Uh, I mean, that was, uh, Sarah had, had done a bunch of work looking at across at a bunch of other towns' plans and, and bringing stuff in. Um, the, the renewables group uh, started much more from the goals, uh, uh, the town goals, uh, but kind of took those and stepped them back to try to set up a, a conversation about why those goals? Why is it that, why has the town made that decision? What is it the town is trying to do? Uh, and then that leads into a, a conversation around sort of principles and, and what's up. I mean, obviously for, for the um, electricity task group, it's going to be a lot about CCA, you know, so they're going to have to understand that um, and uh, understand Rex, you know, because that's going to be one of those choices we're going to have to make. Um, you know, like, God, uh, I'm not looking forward to explaining that. But uh, it's, I, it's, I break out in a sweat whenever I have to explain Rex to anybody from students <laughs> to college administrators. Uh, yeah, um, but the the idea that we're going to um, delve into just a couple scenarios um i think makes it manageable they don't have to understand everything about the electric grid you know mm -hmm. so everybody you know the the two groups left have the opportunity to do this for yourselves right it's not the, the idea is not that there's not the, a preset process uh it's more about getting to what makes sense for that task group uh, and for you. Um, the one thing I will say is that there's been this consistent vision of doing a little bit of data collection with the whole task group, which I think is fantastic. Uh, I think Andra came up with that. It was, uh, it was just a great idea. And um, I think that's something that we might think about across all the task groups is, uh, is setting up some some uh, some questions that we get task group members all of all task group members to kind of collect information on and then bring it back to the task group not as a statistical uh, data set but more as sort of an understanding you know uh, uh, Darcy you were talking about I think it was Darcy uh, um, about uh, actually it wasn't, but I don't remember who it was, uh, about, uh, you know, the cost of electricity and how much 
changing to electricity is one of the things we probably don't have a good handle on is like how much people's places are already electric. Uh, and that's something that, you know, that's something we can start to ask about and gather information and the concept of getting all of the task group members engaged in bringing information into the process, which then they share uh, is pretty powerful. So that was also, you'll hear that uh, in the meetings tomorrow and Friday. Uh, it's pretty great. And then I'd just like to, a um, couple quick things. Uh, we put together the briefing, uh, which is great. Uh, <laughs> nice job, <laughs> including a somewhat goofy process of screwing up the recording uh, and then having to retape the, uh, the uh, um, ASL uh, uh, trans, uh, interpretation process, which worked great. Um, so that's all set. Uh, we have in, uh, we have translated all of the slides into Spanish. Uh, we're going to put together those as a as a second as an addendum to the slide deck. Essentially, this is going to be ready to go pretty quick, um, and it's pretty great. Uh, I just say everybody did a really great job. Um, so that's that's all really good, and the, you know this process is is now picking up steam. Great. Um, well, that's exciting. Any other questions about um, or comments about the task group work? Yeah, Steve. Say I'm looking forward to ours tomorrow morning in the land use group. Um, Lauren sent around the kind of the list of ideas of strategies that came out of ECAC and meeting so far in the MVP. And I'm a bit daunted by the list and how we're going to handle that. So I look forward to talking about that in our meeting tomorrow. And I, I worry a little bit because there's ideas that are big, grand ideas, wonderful ideas, but not something that is necessarily something that ECAC can do or falls under our purview. And there are also some ideas I think are very well meant, but may not rise to the top. And I worry, I've had experience in other contexts where people propose ideas, they get considered but not adopted. And then those people feel like, ah, their time and effort was wasted. Or I've had people say, My, you didn't hear me just because their idea wasn't accepted. So we might need to have some um, expectation management here in that because people put the idea down on a sticky and put it on the wall, that that's not necessarily going to become part of the plan um, and at, at, at the very end. And I like, I think Andre mentioned earlier, having the community sort of have input on how important is this idea for Amherst. Having a kind of a ranking approach seems like that might be a little bit step away from asking people to or an advocate for a particular approach. Yeah. Those are things going around in my head, so I'm looking forward to the Linnean team helping us work some of those out. Fantastic. I think those are great questions, and you know that that's what the conversation needs to be about. Great. Look forward to waking up early for the 9.30 meeting tomorrow. I was going to say that's a great way to start the meeting, Steve. Seriously. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Darcy. Um, I was going to say, uh, just a quick note, um, Lauren will be running those meetings. Um, I will be there in the background taking notes so that Lauren doesn't have to take notes. And I think there's a way that has been used to, uh, to, to rank different actions by criteria, um, you know, emissions reductions, potential, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so. I have, think certain the land use ideas is going to be some. It's going to be difficult to even come up with an estimate for carbon reduction potential for them. A lot of them are quality of life aspects or right. good environmental policy. Right. All right. Well, then we will get an update from you all after your your meeting, and it'd be helpful, I think, next time. Um, to get from, since the ECAC members are just participating in our different task groups to maybe to get um, sort of the overarching uh, overview and bouncing ideas between uh, 
lean and and the ECAC at our next meeting, um, which I know you're bringing to each individual meeting from being there, but sort of having that be kind of a standing agenda item as we kind of go through this process. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, also, we do have notes out of these meetings and the notes will go to the, the committee or the, the facilitation group first and then we'll go to everybody uh, once facilitation group sort of gets their hands on them. Uh, so we'll have meeting or meeting notes out of all of this as well. Okay, great. Wonderful. Um, so with that, I think I'll move on to the next agenda item, um, which is the open meeting law, an, a discussion on open meeting law. Um, Stephanie, did you have something to, to, to tee that up? Um, I didn't. I can, if you bear with me, I can find something. Um, but I didn't because I sort of thought that was kind of your, um, I don't know, your hot topic. So, yeah. Um, and I didn't prepare something either. So maybe we have to wait till next time to talk more about it. I think the idea um, is just sort of stemming off of, of the experiences we've had being remote. Um, and recognizing that not only is Amherst leading the way in virtual participation, but ECAC is leading the way in um, sort of committee work beyond the, t the town council to, to keep moving forward. Um, I think there's an opportunity here to, to articulate challenges that we're having with open meaning law and how they're sort of prohibiting participation. Um, so we talked briefly about this last time and I haven't unfortunately had the chance to really think more deeply about it since then. Um, I did send notes to Mindy and Joe after our, our commu community leader meeting, just letting them know what happened and, and expressing my challenges I think we have with open meeting law and that I don't think it actually is bringing in community members to, to meetings. Um, I had some an email exchange as well with Paul and Lynn about it and Lynn confirmed that they've been talking about it and Darcy maybe you have things to add. I don't know if it's happening at the council level but you know with with every not only with being just vir virtual but in general the public the 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 inability to have meetings and collect input from people in a private way really exposes people and we may not, we're not collecting information from people that don't feel comfortable being exposed in that way. And I think that's a detriment to our democracy. Um, so it sounds like conversations are happening, um, but I think if ECAC has any, um, and individuals of course are welcome to provide thoughts and input on this, but if we wanted to pull together anything from our experiences as ECAC to submit um, to decision makers on this, I think we might want to think about that and, and pull that together kind of as we, as we move forward. I think that's a great idea. Am, am I muted? No. <laughs> uh, no, I think that's a really good idea. And um, it's true that the council um, has been so stymied and it's really, um, it really came out in this week when we had a couple of meetings um, where people, you know, a huge number of people from the public showed up to the meetings that were from the new racial equity coalition, um, uh, including Ashwin. And, um, and they, you know, they weren't, they, they weren't allowed into the meeting um, visually. So they were making these imp impassioned speeches, but we couldn't see their faces. So um, that was just wrong. And, uh, you know, I, ex I have expressed that at each meeting and I get the response that it's being worked on. So <laughs> um, I think that there are remedies uh, and I think other, other um, towns are employing them. So 
I think that we could look at some of those and see if one of them is registering for meetings. I would, can I just add that uh, Northampton has been having a similar process of lengthy public comments about the police and they have, a, they've found a way to make people's faces visible. Yeah, no, yes, from the beginning they have. Yeah. So, um, without risking uh, the Zoom bombing? There hasn't been any, and there's been, uh, there's actually a lot more testimonies in Northampton. I think there were like 100. Those yeah, there were five. Those meetings went on for seven hours or something. So, yeah, I mean, it hasn't happened. And I would add, you know, I mean, because with public process, it's true. You always get some people who do want to be seen, but you will also have people that don't necessarily want to be seen. Um, it's just, a, I think it's a matter of if people want to make the choice to do that is important too. I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just sort of, you know, playing devil's advocate and sort of seeing both sides of, of that issue. Yeah. What are you thinking, Laura? Sorry. What are you thinking of um, what we should be doing? So I think we can, um, so, I mean, one, one sort of easy option is just to kind of put together a memo from ECAC's perspective of what we've experienced trying to run virtual meetings and maybe we hold off until the task group meetings happen and see if we get any more insight from that, but, or one of the task groups or something, but um, sort of put an official statement out as ECAC as saying, you know, this is where we've, where we've struggled and this is where we think open meeting law needs to be, needs to be updated to address virtual meetings. I think there, the potential of virtual meetings to bring even more people to the table is, is big and that could be a positive, but if, um, it's not possible for people to participate or they have to be publicly identified or, or whatever. I think there's, there's, it goes both ways. Um, so that's my first initial thought, but to, to be fair, I haven't given it much more thought since our last meeting. And so maybe think about it a little more if folks have other, other ideas. That would just be one, one potential option. Um, I think also like another example I would give is that the, the school committee gave some, did some great YouTube hosted town halls, but I couldn't figure out how to make a comment or question because I had to like sign in and make a channel and I don't even know. Like, so there's just these limits to, there's these, these additional barriers or having to know that you have to submit per public comment by 3 p.m. Like that's the way the school committee is doing it. Like that just doesn't, that you're, you're constantly putting in barriers to allow people to participate. Um, so, so anyway, that's my initial thought. I'm, I'm hearing just two, two things. So it sounds like on the one hand, uh, we may not have explored all possible options uh, to optimize how we are securing public participation safely with existing open meeting law. And on the other hand, it may be the case that open meeting law is in fact interfering with us arriving at the best solution. I think until we sort of rule out the former being true, it might be premature to move on to the latter, especially because it seems like other towns, other committees uh, are doing better than we're doing, uh, even with open meeting law as it exists. Uh, I, I know I don't have the capacity to look into this in much more detail. Um, I'm not sure if anyone does slash feels inclined to, um, or maybe, maybe, I don't know, because I'm not, I'm not sure that we can actually resolve this just by looking within the town of Amherst, and we may benefit from looking outside the town of Amherst. Because um, if it was just inside the town, I would say maybe Stephanie can address this herself, but I actually don't know if that's the case. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure how to proceed. Yeah, I agree, Ashwin. I think that um, that's a good point. And so I think, I think there are I think within the town, I think, and maybe looking with our peers and working with Sean, potentially ident looking at other, other methods to get more participation in. But I think generally there may be feedback that we want to give bro more broadly about open meeting law to um, the state that I think we should also give based on our, our experiences. But let's wait. I, mean, I, think, I think just the fact, the fact that we're having this conversation and spending time trying to solve this problem, I think is 
already evidence that open meeting law has caused some issues for us and it would be great if the state could invest resources in solving this problem rather than having us spin our wheels. Yeah, agreed. Stephanie? I was just going to say, I mean, you had you had the IT director, IT director there, and you were all able to ask him questions um, about what's possible in terms of safety with the technology that we have. And I think, you know, he answered you all as honestly as he could. Um, so I do think there's some certainly some limitations. Um, it's also not sort of all just on IT, I mean, I think there are also just some sort of procedural guidelines that may make that the issue to what um, Ashwin is alluding to as well. Um, but I agree that, you know, it really is like the, the bigger state open meeting law issue is really like the big broad umbrella because it sort of dictates all of it really. Um, maybe not the technological piece, but certainly the requirements of it dictate you know everything so yeah it's a bigger it's a it's definitely a bigger issue beyond just the town yeah i think that 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 makes sense and i also think that it would be helpful i think just for the state level almost to provide like these are all the these are all the technologies you can use these are the different ways you can use them these are the pros and cons like that would be helpful information from the state level for everyone to have so individual towns aren't trying to make these decisions um, or having to, you know, Sean having to call someone from Northampton to figure out what they're doing and, and all of that, you know. So I do think the state has has let us down a little bit on on moving government forward. I think that the fact that Zoom bombings are happening as frequently as they are, I mean, maybe we haven't experienced a lot of them, but I almost anyone I've talked to has said that they have themselves um, and, you know, people in other circles have experienced them and not even municipal. I know some of them were just like some smaller businesses um, actually were even zone bombed. And I don't even know how that happens, but um, it's a prevalent problem that I think, as you say, Laura, it would be good if the state could offer some sort of um, mechanisms and guidelines and options for everybody. Okay. Yeah. I really I, I think, appreciate you bringing it up, Laura. Yeah, no, I do too. Um, and I think that there are, you know, it, it, it is true that Amherst has made some choices about the way we run our Zoom meetings that are, you know, like it's very different from the way Northampton does. We we use the webinar format, which which creates two categories. You know, the attendees have really complained to me a lot that they can't, they, well, that they aren't participating and they're not seen, but also that they can't even see who else are the other attendees. So they're completely in the dark during the meeting. And sometimes the meetings are two hours. Um, and so um, if you go to Northampton, you know, like if you join the meeting, you're not put in the attendee room. You're, you immediately pop up right next to the mayor. <laughs> so it's it's actually a little scary, <laughs> uh, but uh, but you're you're it's a nice feeling to feel like okay everybody is completely included in this meeting. They can be vis you know they can be seen or not seen. It's up to them. Um, so I I don't really understand why we've made the choices that we have. Okay. I, you know, I would, I would prefer that we not do the webinar format myself because it's very, you know, two worlds, the, the in group and the out group. I was telling Stephanie before we, we started that I was on a webinar that this UN org was, was hosting and I immediately joined in as a panelist. And I was like, oh no, this is not safe. I know from our experience, this is not safe. And it wasn't, it got Zoom bombed. But it's like, it was funny that, you know, I was like, it's a, it's, it's a webinar. Yaya should be an attendee in listen only mode. Um, anyway, side story. Um, so yeah, so I think that we, I don't want us to, to move on and not address this, continue to address this moving forward. So I think, 
as for right now, let's um, just leave it as kind of an open discussion item and let's see, um, I think to Ashwin's point, figuring out what other, like, and, and Darcy, maybe this, this I would throw over to you is from the town council perspective, maybe figuring out how we move away safely from the method we're using to a method more like Northampton's and understanding the pros and cons of that, because I'm sure there are pros and cons. And then um, just think, continuing to think about how we uh, address some of the issues with open meeting law more broadly. Um, moving forward. I really like the idea of moving outside. You know, these groups may not be so big that um, it, it's impossible to have outdoor, in-person, distanced meetings. Yeah. I know there is a, I think that the challenge last time when we accidentally had the outdoor meeting was that there was no bathroom. <laughs> But I do think there's a porta potty on the town's common, right? I mean, I know nobody wants to use a porta potty, but um, so maybe we could have a town common meeting. So think about it. I just think we, we have still, to be careful of the numbers. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. And is it still ten? Is it still ten? That's a good question. Yeah, I think it is ten. Okay. Okay, folks. Well, I, I think um, given that we're all in other meetings this week for ECAC things, I don't think we should belabor this one. Um, I think for the next meeting agenda, I think it'll just sort of be a bit of a continuation of getting updates on the task groups. And I think by that point, we'll probably have some of the full task group meetings at least scheduled so we can talk a bit about that. Um, Anybody else have other agenda items they'd want to add for the next meeting while we're here? Yeah, Stephanie. Well, Laura, I just have a um, kind of practical matter in that um, it's sort of the end of the fiscal year. And so um, elections of officers uh, comes up annually. So um, probably at the next meeting, you want to revisit your um, looking at the chair and co-chair uh, positions or associate vice chair positions and um, having a vote, holding a vote um, to continue as is or if other people want to put themselves in the running, but you should probably do that at the next meeting. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. That's good. A good point. Um, full disclosure is that I probably will not be able to attend the next meeting. I'm, I'm got to wait and see. My children are currently with my parents, which is amazing. Um, and they will be coming back that day. So I can't imagine being allowed to spend two hours on the computer when they first get back. Um, but we'll see. They may come back earlier, depending on how well they're doing at the grandparents' house. So um, I may not be here, so we can either decide I can send a note to the to the group about um, my chair responsibilities and whether or not I feel like I should be nominated to continue or not. And of course, it would be up to you all to vote for that. But um, so we can talk about we can figure that out. I would just report that I'm I'm also a little iffy for ne the next meeting. I'm on vacation, but it's. I think it's turning out to be a stay staycation <laughs> because I don't want to go to North Carolina. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, but so would we actually be voting this next next meeting or just talking about voting um, or, or developing a slate? You would you would be voting. I mean, I don't really honestly see any reason if you wanted to put it off another meeting. Um, but I think at this point it's summertime, so there's likely to always be somebody who's going to be on vacation. Um, and I had given everybody the calendar, so you could take a look um, at that. But so, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, what, what's your preference? Would you all want to wait one more meeting or? And truthfully, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I may be able to make it anyhow because uh, I'm just, staying vacation <laughs> i'm trying to not do much but right. this this i 
I yeah. just won. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, just remember, whoever's not present could easily be voted in. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> so let's um let's look at the Stephanie. Maybe you and I can look at the schedule. And Duane, why don't you keep it updated if you think you're going to be here? Um, and everybody else is going to be here, then I could at least join for the first 30 minutes or something. And, we can do that. Um, and, and that I can definitely do that as well. I mean, if, if well, there's a, if, if that sort of annual thing is taking place, I have no problem making sure I'm on at least for an hour or something. Okay. Well, so maybe let's okay. plan that then. Yeah. I was going to suggest that maybe you just front load it. Yeah. Okay. So we'll add that to the agenda. Any other items? I guess uh, just more for Stephanie is if you've heard whether or not my reappointment has been made official yet. Yeah, I think yeah, there definitely, I know, and, and Ashwin too. Um, as far as I know, they're definitely going to reappoint both of you. Um, it's again, I just want to remind you that every single committee in the town is in the same boat in terms of okay. the end of the year. And so all of these appointments are expired or reappointments come up and they all happen at the same time so it's a little crazy and um it's i know but at least you know at least we've gotten the feedback that you two are definitely going to be reappointed so um you know i think you can move forward with that and understanding that your reappointment is for three years it's not just for a year ah. <laughs> three year sentence <laughs> Good, good to know. All right. <laughs> appointment is for the rest of your natural life. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would like to put on uh, the agenda at some point, if it's not a full meeting, you know, a really full agenda. Um, the question of are we waiting to take current actions or uh, do we want to, you know, make a project as we're going? Because, you know, the task groups for now are going to be where a lot of the work happens. Maybe at our meetings, we could be making some steps forward on a pet project. Yeah, I think that's a good, a good suggestion, uh, Andra. And I think both the question of specific projects, which I would probably kind of tailor the building electrification piece as, as an example of that you know, a project that sort of we're moving forward as in parallel to the task group. But um, particularly if for the next few months, a lot of the work is happening in the task groups and the ECAC meetings are just an opportunity to keep everybody up to date. There may be opportunities to do a little bit to, to round out the agenda with th some more thinking along those lines. So um, yeah, let's maybe put that on the agenda for next week and to talk about it a little more. Yeah, I'm a little I'm a little discouraged that some of the you know the things that were taken out of the budget were all the all the vehicles that were going to be hybrid and electric um, or hybrid anyway the police vehicles and so on. But um, yeah, <laughs> me too, Darcy. <laughs> I had had I was all teed up to apply for the um, some of the grant funding and. Yeah, no. All right. Well, I'll talk to you about that offline, Stephanie. <laughs> um, well, I don't see any, there's no public. Um, so I think we can go ahead and join and you guys can have 14 minutes of your evening back. Um, and we will talk next time. Great. Thank right. you. Bye, Great. everybody. I'll see you, Steve and Ashwin, tomorrow morning. Yes, see you tomorrow. Bye. See you tomorrow, Lauren. Bye.